It was a tumultuous offseason for sure, but the 2023 Giants are good enough to win 90 games and get back into the playoffs. You are Locked On Giants, your daily San Francisco Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Giants, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. My name is Ben Kaspik, and on the show, we provide daily episodes Monday through Friday talking about the San Francisco Giants in a way that's data driven and rational, but also simple, passionate, and accessible to all. I'm a former contributor for the baseball statistics and analysis websites Beyond the Box Score and Rotographs. I have been podcasting about the Giants since 2015. And I'm a lifelong fan. Thank you for making Lockdown Giants your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get podcasts, including YouTube. So check us out there if you have not already. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more with FanDuel. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. And where we get started, we're doing some mailbag questions as we are one day away here from pitchers and catchers reporting to spring training. As you can see, if you're on Twitter or anywhere else really where there's social media, uh, a lot of pitchers and catchers and other you know position players have already reported. And so we're going to start to get that kind of content moving forward and we're back to daily on this show. But the first question here from the mailbag, these are left over from a week or two ago, come, comes from Hans who says, 2023 record projection. So this just gets to the core of it here. We All the talk, all the narratives and all that, it all boils down to how many games are you going to win in the upcoming season? And so you're asking for my prediction, but where I'm going to start is by uh, repeating that the Zips projection was surprisingly strong for the Giants. I thought that it would come in at like 85 wins. And not that it's much different, but the Zips projection for the Giants was 88 wins, which, you know, even in their World Series winning years, they didn't have projections that were that good. And you might think 88 wins is nothing to be too proud of. And that may ultimately be true, but these are projections. And so it's perfectly normal to, you know, uh, exceed your projection, your win projection by four, five, six wins. And so that when you have an 88 win base, it kind of means that it would be perfectly normal to end up in the low 90s. And then that would be a, a strong season for the Giants coming off an 81 and 81 season where I think they hit on kind of their low probability outcomes in terms of underperforming the talent coming off of 2021 when they reached their basically 99th percentile outcome in terms of wins. Couldn't really be any better. Uh, and then Pakoda came out with their projections and had the Giants at 82. And so right in the middle there is 85. And again, that's what I was kind of thinking Zips would come out with. I had been thinking about this myself prior to these projection systems kind of spitting out win total projections. And the number that I was kind of landing on, I was like 86, 87, 88. And so I kind of landed on 87. So that's what I'll go with right now. 87, but like I said, in baseball... Uh, first of all, two things. Number one, it's really, really hard to predict like an actual number. There is no kind of exact science here. Like I said, if you're an 87 win team, you could easily win 95. You could easily win 78. It just kind of happens that way. Uh, and also in baseball, it is not like other sports where you like must be the top team. And if you're kind of one of those last playoff teams that you're somehow, uh, like you have a significantly worse shot than any of the other teams in the playoffs. That's not true. And think of the World Series winning Giants teams. Uh, in 2014, they won 88 games. And in 2010, they won 92. And so we're not talking about 100-win teams. These were teams that were not picked to do well in the playoffs. Uh, but but they had good pitching. They had homegrown talent. And they did do well in the playoffs. Good bullpen, good starters. So anyway... You kind of just need to get there, and then you've got a good shot. And so that's why I don't care. Like, just get in, and I'll be happy. So I'm going 87 at this moment in time, but I promise you it's probably not going to be precisely correct. Next question comes from Andre, who says, You've talked about how certain players, for example, Mike Yastrzemski, could benefit from the shift ban. How much do you anticipate the shift limits will hurt our defense, especially with a relatively unchanged 
infield and a ground ball heavy starting rotation? So it's a great question. And I've, I've kind of shied away. A lot of people have asked me how the shift is going to affect the hitters for the Giants. And it's a little bit above my pay grade. Like, I don't exactly know. And I just kind of want to wait and see. One thing to note, like a lot of people, I've seen Brandon Belt mentioned over and over and over as someone who is going to really benefit from the banning of the shift. But he's not the typical guy that I see benefiting from that in that he's an extreme fly ball hitter. And a lot of the San Francisco Giants are fly ball hitters like that has been a total emphasis of this new regime led by Farhan Farhan Zaidi is that they 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 have hitters who hit the ball in the air a lot more than they used to and they kind of avoid guys who hit the ball on the ground a lot and so I think kind of disproportionately the Giants hitters but if you hit line drives I mean it helps you as well to not have a guy standing out in shallow right field uh, if you're a left-handed hitter and you hit a low liner you know, it could be a ground ball to that short right fielder versus just a, a single every time over the second baseman's head if there's the shift restriction. But it's, it's I don't know, is the answer. And that's why I avoid this question for the hitters generally. But for the pitchers, it's a really good question because they do have such a ground ball heavy staff. And I'll even take your statement one further in that you said they didn't really changed the defense in the infield they did in that there were subtractions from some of the guys who have better reputations defensively in Brandon Belt and Evan Longoria but I will also point out last year when the defense was such a problem Brandon Belt was not helping uh, with his bad knee when he was out there he was actively hurting them defensively last year and so when we're comparing last year to this year that's worth mentioning is that he was kind of a net negative last year Longoria I think was still a positive uh But at first and third, I think the shift is going to be less important, the shift restrictions, because you always, well, I guess the third baseman would shift over, but especially at first, they're not going to really change. They can't get too far away from the bag because on a ground ball, they need to be able to get back to first and cover the base for the out on a grounder. But at third, I mean, it's not like you were seeing much range out of Longoria in a shift, right? And so I think it really affects second baseman more than anything. Because they were the guys who were like backing up and into deep right field. And now you can't. You've got to stand both feet on the dirt. And I think that range becomes important. And I think it actually helps the Giants. Because Tyro Estrada is an athletic, relatively young, and rangy player. uh, Fast, you know. So uh, if you have like a Tommy LaStella or a Wilmer Flores kind of penciled in as your starting second baseman... That's a problem. And some teams around the league, including the Giants in 2021, for example, like La Stella was supposed to be the guy playing second base most of the time. And that would be a problem. But when it's Estrada, I think relatively speaking, it actually helps the Giants because of his youth and athleticism and speed. His range will play better. Not when, when, you know, the league can't shift. He becomes more above average because the range matters more and I think he has it and I've said this over and over but don't look too much into the fact that by one metric defensive run saved Tyro Estrada had a tough defensive year I think he at times had some issues like just watching him but other metrics don't agree that he was horrible and defensive run saved even doesn't agree with itself in previous years and so it kind of looks like an outlier to me so I think that Estrada a rebound defensively by the numbers and uh, the eye test just continuing to be solid uh, could be a positive. And then I think Crawford has always been a good defender. And so up the middle and then at the corners, I don't think it matters as much. So coming up in just a minute, I'll wrap up that question. We're also going to get to others, including what's the deal with Isan Diaz? He was going to get called up late last year, but ended up having an injury and we didn't see him. But what's going to be his status going into 2023? So we'll get into it in just a minute. But before we do, This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. It's the midway point of the NBA season, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use, and then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores to threes drained. I'm currently looking at the NBA All-Star Game, which is always a lot of fun, and right now you can bet on who's going to win that game. Is it Team Giannis, the odds at plus 108, or Team LeBron at minus 126? Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine bets 
for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. Don't miss your chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, here we go. We are going to finish up with that question. I mostly answered it, but I just wanted to essentially say that, I mean, at first and third, like David VR kind of projects to be that third baseman right now. I think Wade has a chance to be better than Belt was last year because, again, Belt was not good. With He really was not moving well. If you watched all the games, he was just barely moving at all uh, last season. So VR is more of a question for me, and I think that you're right. Like This staff as a whole, not just the starters, they get a ton of ground balls. So infield defense is going to be really important. And if there's like an injury to Estrada or Crawford, it, it starts to put people in positions you don't want to see them in. And so... There are some concerns there, but the starting guys, I think, should be okay. But if you start to have to go into next layers of depth, there's some concern there. That's why a guy like Casey Schmidt, who's going to probably start the year in AAA and is a plus-plus defender at third, could really, and they're, they've said he's going to see some shortstop in spring training. He's been invited to Major League Camp. And so if he has a great year in AAA, great couple months or whatever, and then kind of factors into the major league team, it could really help stabilize a lot of things all at once. And so that's something to watch as the season gets going. Thanks for making Lockdown Giants your first listen every day. Uh, Lockdown MLB Prospects host Lindsey Crosby is a prospect encyclopedia, and he's going deep on the MLB stars of tomorrow, recently talked about the Giants. So check it out. It's free and available wherever you get podcasts. So the next question is kind of related into what I was saying about depth in the infield. Uh, Gordon Zola says, I am not saying it makes sense, but I have been obsessed with Isan Diaz since he didn't get a chance to make it up to the majors last year. Do you think we will see him in San Francisco in 2023? Uh, I think you probably do. And the reason I'm saying that is kind of for two reasons. Number one, they essentially said he was in line to get a look in the majors at the end of the last season, but he got hurt. He, I think he hurt his oblique and So he never got that call. The second reason is that they added him to the 40-man roster in the offseason. So he is a guy who, you know, when you're on the 40-man, your odds of kind of making it to the majors go way up. So Diaz, of course, a former, like, top prospect. He was a centerpiece in, I think it was the Christian Yelich trade from the Brewers to the Marlins. He got moved and then played in the majors. Here's the thing. It's like he was so bad in the majors with the Marlins in 500, exactly 500 plate appearances. He hit 185, 275 on base, 287 slugging, like dreadful. And so my kind of hope for him is a little bit muted. Like I'm kind of pessimistic about what's going to happen with him. He is only 26 years old. Like I said, a former top prospect. But uh, also I want to point out defensively, he was not good in the major leagues. He, uh, 735 and two-thirds innings at second base in his major league career, put up negative seven defensive runs saved, negative five ultimate zone rating. And the way you read that is outs above or runs above average. So minus five runs above average or five runs below average. And then by outs above average, which is a stat cast metric, negative 12 outs above average in his major league career. So just this is what I'm talking about. With Estrada, you kind of have one blip where it was like negative. But with Diaz, every year, every metric agrees, poor defense. And so I'm just kind of like, I don't really see the fit necessarily with a guy who has really struggled with the bat in his major league career. Although I'm willing to hope that he can improve upon that because he's got the pedigree, whatever. But defensively if he's not going to be able to play good defense then I I have a hard time seeing where the value is and where he he would fit on a team that really needs kind of middle infield help and some lefties maybe and he is a left-handed hitter but you got to have good defense and and so I just I don't know we'll see I I wouldn't be shocked if he gets an opportunity but he's got to improve defensively uh, Mook Tumbo says, any word on Will Wilson's development? How would you uh, evaluate that trade a couple years later? Cozart got paid that entire salary rather than have it prorated for 2020 in 2020. So this is this is one I've been looking forward to answering. And 
I see this talked about a lot. Like, okay, so if you missed it somehow, what the Giants did is they, in the first offseason under Farhan Zaidi, they traded uh, for Will Wilson. They basically bought a prospect by taking on an underwater deal. It's like essentially if like the equivalent of Tommy Lastella's last year with the Giants, uh, they just cut him loose. But imagine if some team had said, hey, we'll take on Tommy Lastella's last year in which you owe him $11.5 million. But in return, uh, the Giants, we would need you to throw in your first round pick from last year. And so that's essentially what the Angels did here, giving the Giants Will Wilson in exchange for the Giants taking on the one-year 13-ish million dollars owed to Zach Kozart. So my opinion at the time and my opinion today has not changed, which is that it was a good move for the Giants and a stupid move by the Angels. Uh, And by stupid, I mean the fact that they're willing to give up their first round pick. He went, Will Wilson went 15th overall that summer uh, in exchange for just taking on one year of an underwater contract. It's simply Angels ownership not wanting to pay uh, because they then went out and signed Anthony Rendon and like they weren't, I guess, willing to make that commitment unless they cleared some money. And so it doesn't matter if Will Wilson works out or not, in my opinion, it was a it was a worthwhile move to make, and they should do it again if they could. Obviously, you hope that it does work out. And in terms of the Will Wilson's actual development, I mean, he had a solid season in Double A, but went to Triple A and struggled. Uh, strikeout rate was too high in Double A; it was like thirty percent. Uh, but he did have a nice thirteen percent walk rate. Uh, hit for some power. So I, I'm intrigued. He wasn't great in double A, but some intriguing kind of signs here. Hit for the power, like I said, uh, and a good walk rate, but struck out too much. And, you know, batting average was just 225 and then went to triple A and the strikeout rate was 39% in just 10 games, but still not a great kind of showing in triple A. I think he dealt with some injuries as well. Last year, he has been in, invited to major league camp, but I just, I just, it kind of bugs me when people say it was like a huge mistake or it's backfired in a major way. It's, it was a smart move at the time, and it still looks smart to me in hindsight. It's a gamble. And all they did, like people complain about the lack of spending, but the Giants were the only team, it seems, that was willing to spend to buy young talent. And I think that that's what they should have been doing at the time. And the fact that they ended up having to pay the entirety of Will Wilson or of uh, Zach Cozart's contract because they cut him before COVID happened. And if they had just held on to him and then COVID happened and then what ended up happening is any players under contract for 2020 had their salaries kind of prorated to a 60 game rate. Uh, but for Wilson, because they cut him before all of that happened, they paid him the whole salary. So it, they kind of got hosed, but it was totally out of their control of the circumstance and the the circumstances and of course they couldn't have seen that coming ahead of time so that's all just like a fluke freak thing and I commend them for doing this and I hope that they'll do it again and uh yeah it's just it's about the process not really about the result here but obviously you basically just got a first rounder for free but it, it does just add to the list of first round failures that they've had in in recent years I mean he was a first round pick in 2019 and he also just hasn't kind of turned into anything yet but you know if you can just get your get a first rounder from the most recent draft anytime just for spending a little cash then they should do it next question comes from uh, Ryan who says will the Giants add more bullpen depth before the season begins and the, some of these questions are a little unfair because they were asked like weeks ago. And so a couple weeks going by and still nothing happening. I don't know if you still would want to ask this question, but to me, the answer is no. I think that they've got a lot of bullpen depth. They've got a bunch of guys who are just like slam dunks to make it. They've got some starters who kind of bleed over into the bullpen, like maybe Di Sclafani and Junis projecting into that bullpen right now. And then they've got some young guys who can take up that seemingly last spot, like Cole Waits, RJ, RJ Dabovich, and Thomas Zapucky, Sam Long, all of those guys, there's only like one spot for any of them. And that's a handful of intriguing young guys. And so I wouldn't really expect them to do much more in the bullpen. So coming up in just a minute, uh, are the Giants going to lead the league in FIP again? 
in 2023? And what would it take to get Corbin Burns, another local guy that, that may be of interest to the Giants? We'll get into it in just a minute. But before we do... All right, here we go. We are going to talk about, will the Giants lead the league in FIP again? King of Norway says, will the Giants have the best fielding independent pitching in the National League this year? Starters and bullpen combined. Number one in 2022. King of Norway says, I say yes, and it might not be close. And I don't see any reason why they couldn't. One thing to keep in mind is that Carlos Rodon had a big part in that. Carlos Rodon, I believe, led the major leagues in fielding independent pitching last year. And so taking him out, certainly, yeah, I mean, he had a 2.25 fielding independent pitching last year, which is just spectacular. And, you know, he leveraged that to a $162 million deal with the Yankees. But Webb is a FIP darling. Alex Cobb was a FIP darling, certainly. We talked about this yesterday when we were projecting the Giants pitching staff, like predicting the opening day roster. So I'll say like maybe they don't lead it, but certainly they're they'll they'll be one of the top teams, possibly like a top five team in all of baseball. Wouldn't be shocked at all. I, I wouldn't I don't have it pulled up, but I believe they probably were among the leaders, if not first in 2021 as well. So this is one of those things that the defense masked this. They were number two, one tick behind the Dodgers in 2021. They had a 3.55 fielding independent pitching. Dodgers were at 3.54. And by the way, the Giants' ERA in 2021 was 3.25. So they outperformed the fielding independent pitching. And then if you look at uh, 2022, they had a fielding independent pitching. I just hit on uh, hitters instead of pitchers. But their fielding independent pitching was indeed first in the National League at 3.45. Better than 2021. But their ERA, instead of beating it, they underperformed it with an ERA of 3.86. And so hopefully this year they kind of have a, the same in that same range with fielding independent pitching. But the ERA maybe just one year they underperformed, one year they overperformed. How about this year they just perform as expected and kind of have the ERA match the fielding independent pitching? I would take that and certainly would prefer if they even outperformed it. But it's a good question. I think not necessarily first because you lose Rodon, but maybe still really good because you've got some good guys there. Next question comes from Matt, who says, what do you think it would take uh, to trade for Cor Corbin Burns? He's a local kid. Bring him home. So it would take a lot. And I think the Brewers are planning on contending. Some of the moves they made were kind of win now type of moves. I'm not sure that trading Corbin Burns is something they're going to want to do unless I think you could see something like that if the Brewers are out of contention in the summer. And so if the Brewers find themselves like below 500 or something, he certainly could be a name that gets brought up as a trade possibility. And then going into the offseason, if their outlook doesn't look great going into 2024, he's definitely a guy who could end up getting moved. But it would take a lot. I mean, he is literally a top, top pitcher in the sport and he's got a couple years of team control remaining at affordable salaries. This year, making just over $10 million. And next year, you would figure 15, you know, through arbitration, 15 something, 15, 16 million dollars, something like that. But my big point here is the Giants, I don't think, are in position to give up what it would take to get a guy like this. I said it with, uh, who did I say it with? I, I said it with guys this offseason. Maybe even like Soto towards when the trade deadline was finally coming up last year. I just said, I don't think the Giants are in position to give up Kyle Harrison, Marco Luciano, Luis Matos, uh, everyone for a couple years of Juan Soto, two and a half years of Juan Soto. It's just not enough service time. And so when you're talking about Corbin Burns, you're, you're probably talking the Brewers would want Kyle Harrison in exchange for Corbin Burns. And it's two years of Burns versus six plus years of Kyle Harrison. And I just don't think that is the type of move you can make if your major league team is already great and already has a bunch of homegrown under team control talent. And then your farm system also has some studs. Then you do that to like put yourself over the top. But in the Giants position, they really need their young guys to like come up, become good and have all that team control. So I don't, I don't see this as something that they should do and therefore I don't think it is something that is likely but I mean and also they've got money to spend and so when the offseason comes around just sign guys with that and then you don't have to give up 
the young talent. And they haven't necessarily done that, but they've tried with some position players. I think we've seen with the Harper pursuit, with the Judge pursuit, with the Correa pursuit, for big superstars, they're willing to write fat checks. But otherwise, you're going to see these kind of smaller deals. And a lot of your star talent has to come from within. And that is what I'm talking about here. And it has everything to do with years of team control. So yeah, that's how I feel about that. Anyway, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks again for making Lockdown Giants your first listen every day. Now make your second listen Lockdown MLB Prospects. Host Lindsey Crosby is a prospect encyclopedia, and he's going deep on the MLB stars of tomorrow. It's free and available wherever you get podcasts. Once again, my name is Ben Kaspik. Check me out on Twitter at Ben Kaspik, K-A-S-P-I-C-K. If you like this show, please consider rating it or leaving a review. It helps me out a lot, so thanks in advance. And thank you to everyone who's done so already. Coming up throughout the rest of the week, we've got more mailbag questions we could get into and also the latest from spring training with pitchers and catchers reporting on Thursday. So can't wait to be with you again two more times this week. Thanks again for listening. You are now Locked on Giants.